Hey, on, on behalf of the Fish and Wildlife Department, Department and the Vermont Fish and Wildlife, Wildlife Board, Board, welcome. Uh, thank you all for, for coming out. Um, I want to call it maybe our, our second summer evening that we've had. Um, we're finally getting our summer weather, and uh, now we can barely ache how hot and warm it is and muggy. A little while ago, we'd say, gosh, it's just too cold. But for those of you I haven't had the pleasure to meet before, uh, my name is Mark Scott. I'm the Director of, of Wildlife um, for the Fish and Wildlife Department. Our mission here tonight is primarily to hear from you. Um, every comment you give us or question, we're going to jot it down. Um, we're going to spend some time collating all of that. Um, I'd like to share it with all of you individually. All the comments we hear tonight, if you leave us your email address. But if you don't want to do that, that's okay. Um, we'll have it all up on our department website um, for you to see all the comments. Every comment since we started this process back in April when the Fish and Wildlife Board changed our fur bear management rule. And basically the topic was creating, creating best management practices for legal regulated trapping in the state of Vermont and to make changes in regulations on people that hunt coyotes with the aid of dogs. So the department staff worked with many of you in this room, different constituents um, in the whole past year, have been working to create rules that make both of those activities more safe and more humane, um, as we were asked to do by Vermont legislature um, to do that. Um, I can't thank you all enough for spending the time here tonight to come because we need to hear from each and every one of you. The format that we have set for tonight is we'll have a little overview from our staff, Kim Royer, who was our fur bear project leader for decades here in the state of Vermont. Um, she graciously accepted to come back and help us through this process after she retired um, to do that. And along with Major Sean Fowler, the Assistant Director of Law Enforcement, we'll chat a little bit about the regulations on hunting coyotes with the aid of dogs. So those two people are gonna to try to set the stage. And then we have a lot of department staff here and we're gonna ask your cooperation and help to get into some breakout groups so that each and every one of you will have a chance to be heard tonight by us and recorded. And then we'll present all that information to the Fish and Wildlife Board. Speaking of the board, that's the primary regulatory body in the state of Vermont that deals with most of the hunting, fishing, and trapping regulations that legislature gives us authority to do. I know I've seen some board members here firsthand, so if I can kind of quickly go around the room, we'll start over here. Brian, I'll put you on the spot to go first, but state who you are and then what county you live in. going through the introductions of our other department staff. They're going to be at the breakout tables uh, working with you, and you'll get to meet um, some of those folks here tonight. Again, this meeting principally is we want to hear from you. We're going to try to set the stage here in the next 20 minutes or so, and then we're going to need your help and cooperation to get in some breakout groups. Uh, we kind of had a, a little curveball thrown at us here in the late innings of this game where we had a, a different room set up. but. We are, we are, the tables are out, out back in the hallway, and depending on how we can manage that, we'll probably have a few folks in here working with department staff. So again, on behalf of the Fish and Wildlife Board and the department, I can't thank you enough for giving up your evening to come here tonight. Um, this is important. So I'm gonna turn it over to Kim Royer. And if Kim, you wanna walk us through um, on the fur bear management changes. Thank you. Sure, thank you, Mark. So I'm going to walk through the fur bear best management practices proposed regulations and then uh, Major Fowler will take over and he will walk through the hunting coyote with hounds regulations. So um, we're talking about best management track practices for trapping. Uh, we are actually the only state in the nation as far as I know that has tried to take 
what were uh, recommendations and um, convert them to regulations. So there was no template for us to follow. So this has taken us quite a while. We've actually been working on this for almost a year. I think we started in July of last year. Um, and we it began with the 2022 legislature. They passed Act 159. They directed the department and the board to come up with recommendations for best management practices for trapping that would improve specifically animal welfare and selectivity. And they went on to say the BMPs shall be based on investigation and research conducted by scientists and experts at the Department of Fish and Wildlife and shall use the best management practices for trapping in the United States issued by the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies as the minimum standards. And you'll see the picture on the, the board up there is the picture of this monograph. This is a prestigious Journal of Wildlife Management monograph that actually presents an overview of the BMP research project that's gone on for the last 25 years, national research project. So let me just talk a little bit about one slide about what are best management practices for those of you who don't know. Um, and in this case, they were, um, there's a national research effort, like I said, started in 1997, I believe, um, and basically there have been 2,000 pairs of trappers and trapper technicians out on the landscape across 41 states testing traps. Vermont actually participated in this effort maybe eight, 10 years, something like that. Um, and, and those technicians would send back the data to statisticians who would then analyze the data to ensure that there was, the bias was eliminated. Uh, the, the protocols for the data and the protocols for the whole study were actually set up by the International Organization for Standardization. And they resulted in best management practices for trapping. And some of you may have seen the booklets that are available um, that help to show you what types of traps and trapping systems you might use for um, different species. The, the goal behind this effort was um, animal well, improving animal welfare, improving selectivity, improving selectivity, um, efficiency, practicability, and safety. And based on the international standards, which, like I said, is the premier standardization setting group in the world, it's, um, they, they basically 59% of the traps pass and 41% failed. So we used the research and the information that we got from the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies as closely as we could uh, to try to develop these best management practices. Um, and actually 9,000 animals were sent to veterinarians for necropsy and that's how they determined whether or not these traps passed or failed by the injury rates. So there, the legislature actu actually outlined seven directives and we tried as closely as we could to stick to those directives and I will refer back to these as we go through the regulations uh, just so you can see which regulations actually address which directives. But I'll go through these one at a time right now. So they, they directed us to propose trapping devices that are designed to minimize injury to a captured animal. They, established, they directed us to establish criteria for adjusting or maintaining trapping devices so that they operate correctly and humanely. Uh, they required that we recommend trapping techniques including appropriate size and type of traps for target animals, use of lures or other attractants, trap safety, methods to avoid non-target animals. They recommended requirements for the location of traps at a safe distance from public trails, class four roads, playgrounds, parks, and other public locations where persons may reasonably be expected to recreate. Uh, they directed us to develop criteria for when and how live captured animals should be released or dispatched. Uh, they directed us to revise the trapper education materials, which I think the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies is in the process of doing. Um, and we already have information about best management practices in our current trapper education classes. And then they directed us to estimate uh, what it would cost to fund replacement traps. 
And we did this estimate, we submitted it in our report to the le legislature in January, um, but as yet, I don't believe there's any funding that's been um, tagged for this. So, what are the recommendations? I'm gonna go through these one by one, and you'll see that there are, there's the, the text that's black, and then you'll see highlighted portions in yellow. And what this is, uh, the, the board passed the text in black last April. And then the department has made, subsequently made some recommendations that I put up there in, in yellow. When you go to your breakout groups, there'll actually be materials at the table that will allow you to review these again, because it's very dense. There's a lot of information here. And I'm actually going to read through it in case you can't really see it that well. Um, but again, don't feel like you have to memorize any of this. Those materials will be at your breakout tables and you'll be able to look at them again. So basically, um, this is, this is a trying to address legislative charges one, two, and three. So again, remember one is uh, designed to minimize injury to captured, designed to minimize injuries to captured animals. Uh, directive two is to establish criteria for adjusting or maintaining trapping devices so that they operate correctly and humanely. And three is to re re recommend trapping techniques including appropriate size and type of traps for target animals, trap safety, and methods to avoid non-target animals. So these one, two, three, four, five bullets. Um, the first one is that trapping systems should have base plates that feature a center chain mount with a swivel with free moving chain and at least, and we, we changed the, we're recommending, I shouldn't say we changed it because this is just a recommendation, that the board consider changing that from one swivel to two. Additional swivels that allow mobility for captured animals. Uh, that foothold traps on land must be anchored with a maximum of 18 inch chain, extra swivels and or shock springs can be added to the chaining system. Foothold traps on land must be triggered by down, that all traps that are triggered by downward pressure must be adjustable for pan tension. Foothold traps on land must be padded or offset and laminated with a minimum jaw thickness of no more than 5 sixteenths of an inch and, or fully encapsulating the foot. Foothold traps on land must have a jaw spread of no more than six and, actually I need my glasses to see the little, six and a quarter inches measured inside the widest expanse of the jaws. Uh, there, the board in the last vote actually included um, legalizing drags and the department is recommending that maybe that be taken out until drags have been tested through the BMP research effort. Issue two, um, body gripping traps and this one is addressing legis le legislative charge three again which is to recommend trapping techniques that, that include appropriate size and type of trap for target animals um, trap safety and methods to avoid non-target animals. Uh, so again, 4.6, a person shall not set a body gripping trap with a jaw spread opening greater than 60 square inches measured inside the widest expanse of the jaws unless the trap is five feet or more above the ground or in the water. The board voted no meat-based baited body gripping trap shall be set on the ground unless placed within an anchored enclosure with an opening no greater than 60 square inches and with a trap trigger that is recessed at least 12 inches from all openings. The department is recommending take out the meat-based and say no body gripping traps shall be set on the ground unless placed within an anchored enclosure, blah, blah, blah. Um, 4.8. The board voted meat-based body gripping traps with a jaw spread up to and including 60 square inches can be used on land if the trap is placed at least five feet above the ground. Again, we are, we are recommending that body gripping traps with a jaw spread up to and including 60 square inches can be used on the land if the trap is placed at least five feet above the ground. The changes by removing meat-based basically means that all body gripping traps have to either be five feet off the ground, in the water, or um, in an enclosure that's anchored. Issue three, baits and lures. This again addresses legislative charge three, which uh, directed the department to um, address the use of lures and other attractants. And this is, this is to minimize the capture of non-target species, particularly avian species. 4.9, all meat-based bait shall be covered at the time that a trap is set, 
Covering shall include, but are not limited to, brush, branches, leaves, soil, snow, water, or enclosures constructed of wood, metal, wire, plastic, or natural materials. And issue four, trails and public highway offsets. So the, the board actually voted to um, set, to require that foothold traps on or within 25 feet of a traveled portion of a public highway or trail um, must be in the water or five feet above the ground. And the department is recommending, mostly for simplicity's sake, that both foothold and conibear traps, uh, an offset should be 50 feet. So it reads, the recommended reading right now is no body gripping traps on or foothold traps shall be set on or within 50 feet of the traveled portion of a town trail, public trail, or highway, unless set in the water. This setback requirement shall not apply to public trails and class four highways located in wildlife management areas. And the reason for that is wildlife management areas have been many, many of them have been purchased with um, dollars from hunters and trappers and are there for wildlife based recreation, including hunting and trapping. The definitions, and it's important to um, understand the definitions as they apply to this particular proposed regulation. So public highway, for the purposes of this rule, means roads including class four roads shown on the highway maps of the respective towns made by the Agency of Transportation, but does not include foot trails or public roads. Public trail, for the purposes of this rule, means a pedestrian footpath on Vermont state-owned public land open to the public and designated and mapped by the managing agency or department. Again, not including wildlife management areas. And then the department's recommending that we add town trail, which shall mean a public right of way as defined in 19 VSA 3018, shown on the highway maps of the respective towns made by the agency of transportation. So it's hard to see this, but this is the town of Bridgewater. Basically all the lines on that map would require a 50 foot offset. Issue number five, Humane Dispatch, and this covers, um, let's see, I guess, let me just see here, which one is it? The directive number, number five, yep. So develop criteria for when and how live captured animals should be released or dispatched. So the board voted at the last, in the April meeting, um, to include the following language. Dispatch of trapped animals. Upon discovery, a trapper shall immediately dispatch a live trapped fur bearer with a muzzle loader, gun, crossbow, or bow and arrow. This provision may be amended upon receipt of the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies recommendations regarding humane dispatch. This subsection shall not be interpreted to prevent a trapper from releasing an unharmed captured animal or a domestic pet. Um, <coughs> And the reason why they put in the part about the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies is there's actually a working group that's working on dispatch guidelines right now, but they haven't quite completed those. And once they send those to us, we might revisit this again. So that's basically all of it in a nutshell. If you, have, if you want more information, you can go on our website to the, to the top web uh, address and you'll see the report that we submitted to the legislature, which is a previous iteration of all of this, so it's not the same language as what I just went through with you tonight, but also other materials. And if you want to learn more about best management practices, uh, Bryant White and Nathan Roberts, for those of you who weren't there, gave a presentation at the November public meeting, and that is on our website um, on a YouTube video, and it goes into way more depth than I went into tonight on what best management practices are and, and what went into creating them. So, I will pass it over to the Major. Thank you, everybody. Welcome, everybody. So, the other reason we are here is to talk about the practice of pursuing coyotes with the aid of hounds. So, Legislative Act 165, which came out of the 2022 legislative session, um, put a moratorium on the practice of pursuing coyotes with Ada hounds um, with a couple of pretty stringent exceptions for landowner and damage type situations. 
The moratorium went into effect on July 1st of 2022, and essentially there was no coyote hounding in the state of Vermont until such time as the Fish and Wildlife Board and the Department of Fish and Wildlife could come up with regulations to govern the practice. Okay? The legislature also put um, more restrictions on it. The legislature basically said they don't want any more than 100 permits issued in a given year, and only 10% of those permits can be issued to non-residents, and that is based on the number of resident permits from the previous year. They also put in there um, land or for training season for non-residents, and we'll get into the training seasons and the hunting seasons in a little bit. Uh, the training season for non-residents is tied directly to the home state of that houndsman. So if they don't have a open training season in their home state, they can't come to the state of Vermont and train their dogs here. Um, and then the other part is they, uh, there's more restrictions for this practice when it comes to landowners. So a coyote hounder cannot go on posted property unless they have written permission from the landowner where they are running their hounds. And then above and beyond that, if the property is unposted and the property owner does not want hounds on their property and then they inform law enforcement and then law enforcement informs the hound hunter or a member of their hunting party, then that hound hunter cannot go back to that piece of property. And if they do, there's penalties, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, so when the department looked at it before they brought stuff to the board, basically what we did was we took the bear hound rule and adopted much of it for the pursuit of coyotes with the aid of hounds. So a lot of the stuff is gonna be very, very similar. There's some notable exceptions when we get to them, I'll kind of point them out. So the other parts of this that the legislature mandated is they, there needed to be a limit on the pack size, so the number of dogs that can be on a hunt for coyotes. Um, there was a prohibition on the substitution of dogs, so no relaying, which is already in the bear rule, so the, if folks did that, they should be used to that already. Um, then there was a, a definition of control that would minimize the likelihood that dogs will enter land posted against hunting or where the pursuit of coyotes with dogs is not authorized. It goes back to what I talked to you a few minutes ago, or a second ago, about the landowner stuff. There is also a requirement for all coyotes that are killed during the pursuit with hounds, they have to be reported to the Fish and Wildlife Department. They also could, said that the board should consider seasonal um, restrictions and baiting. So as a direct result of that legislative act, there was two new laws that came into effect in the state of Vermont in 2022. This is one of them. It is Title 10 VSA 5008 and it is titled, you know, hunting coyotes with the aid of dogs. This is where it lays out and gives the commissioner um, permission to have the permits. It lays out the number of permits, which is 100 permits total annually. It lays out that only 10% of those permits can go to non-residents based on the total number of permits from the previous year. Um, it also lays out the training season for non-residents is tied to the home state. And then it lays out the fee structure and basically for a resident it is $50. For a non-resident it is a $10 uh, application fee. And then if they are granted a permit it is $200 to obtain that permit. The other law that came out is Title 10 VSA 5009. And that is the pursuing uh, coyotes with the aid of dog and that is the landowner permission. And that is the actual statutory language of what I just described to you just a few seconds ago about if it's posted, written permission is required ahead of time. And if it's not posted and the landowner doesn't want the hunter there, they have to notify law enforcement. Law enforcement has to notify the houndsman or someone in their party, and then they cannot go back. It also lays out the penalties for this in this state statute. Okay, If you look down at C, uh, the first offense, of a person who violates this, it shall be considered a minor fish and wildlife uh, violation, which would result in five point violation. There has not been any uh, fine associated with it yet. That'll come later. And then 
Uh, number two, it basically lays out that any uh, subsequent offenses would be a 10 point violation. So, um, as far as the legislative mandates, the limit of dogs. So, there's terminology in there and it is department registered dogs and basically what that means is, is when the department issues a bear or a coyote hound permit to a hunter, it will come with brass tags that are fixed to the dog's collars with numbers on them and that is what would constitute a registered dog with the department. Um, a pack of dogs, so if a hunter is out, they are only allowed four dogs to pursue coyotes, which is down from bears. The bear, it is six, so it is, it is more restrictive than that. Um, the other part of it was legal method of take, which falls in line with virtually every other piece of hunting that we do in the state of Vermont, okay? So the legal means of taking coyotes with the aid of dogs include the utilization of a muzzleloader gun, bow and arrow, or crossbow. Basically lays out that if someone chooses to use archery equipment, whether that's a compound bow, long bow, whatever, or a crossbow, they have to have archery ed. That's being folded into all new regulations just to have everything kind of standardized. And then the same thing with the last bullet point down there, it discusses the, the minimum standard for a broadhead, which is 7 eighths of an inch with two sharp cutting edges which is standard in many of our regulations. Uh, definition of control. So I will read this one to you verbatim. Uh, the transportation, loading or unloading of dogs from a vehicle and the handling, catching, restraining, releasing dogs to pursue coyote. GPS collars with track log and training slash control functions or separate GPS and training collars, training control collars shall be required to locate and track dogs at all times when in pursuit of coyotes. At no time shall a dog be in pursuit of coyotes without a GPS track log being maintained by the permit holder. So essentially what this means is if they are out there pursuing coyotes with hounds, they have to have a collar that tracks and a training collar that, get down below it, training and control collars is, is any in a family of collars that delivers electric electrical stimulation of varying intensities and duration to the neck of a dog via a radio controlled electronic device incorporated into the collar. So they will have to have both of those or one collar that has both of those functions. So it has to be a tracking collar and it has to be a control collar. Uh, required, uh, required reporting, so every coyote that is taken with the aid of dog, the um, Permit holder is going to be required to report all of those within 48 hours of the close of the season um, in a manner that has been required by the commissioner and the commissioner has yet to establish that. But that will get done later on in this process. Um, and then at the very bottom it basically says no coyote carcass will be taken out of the state of Vermont unless it has been reported in the manner directed by the commissioner. Uh, seasons and shooting hours, so the coyote hound training season for Vermont residents and non-resident permit holders is June 1st through September 15th. Bearing in mind for non-residents, they have to have a training season open in their home state to come here to train. Uh, the June 1st to September 15th falls in line with virtually every other dog hunting and training season that we have. Um, I already talked about the non-residents, so the coyote hunting season will be December 15th through March 31st for those pursuing with hounds. The regular hunting season isn't affected by this, it's just ones that are pursuing coyotes with the aid of hounds. December 15th through March 31st. Legal hunting hours, most other things are the same, one half hour before sunrise until one half hour after sunset. And that it is in a nutshell for the coyote hounding part. Mark? Jeff, Tom, thank you very much for the thorough presentation and review all that. Um, now we're at the moment of the important part of the meeting that you get from the um, David, are you around South Right here. Uh, okay. What's the game plan for oh, roughly how many folks per table? We had about 66, 66 that I called it. Uh, so we'd like to break up into nine groups. We okay. have six tables outside. And we'll break up in here, we'll have three groups just kind of sit in rows and we'll go over the paperwork. 
take time. So we can kind of just ask people if they want to step outside. We'll have a facilitator. We'll send to each table once people have gotten set up. Um, I don't know if there's a group up front that wants to stay here in each section just so it can break up a little easier. And Justin just can find a table outside. So we've got eight or nine people at each table. Paperwork, pens for you. The questions that is really important that we get to input on these regulations that are here. After we go through that facilitated process with staff, uh, people are welcome to come on back. Um, we'll talk about where we're going to go from here on the next step, the next board meeting, legislative committee on administrative rules. Um, we're going to do that. And also, if it's not too late, we'll be happy to entertain any other comments from people in a reasonable time. So. Why don't you? We appreciate your cooperation, and we may not have mentioned it. There's a bathroom. Okay, if we can have um, everybody who wants to take a seat, um, if you could, we'd like to uh, wrap this up and then also entertain time if anybody wants to share any other comments or questions um, for the board and the department. So, you got the slide up here, um, July 19th. The um, Fish and Wildlife Board will be doing a second vote on the rules that you heard tonight on both of those subjects, all within the rule of fur bear management. Then the department will be pulling together the second vote, trying to schedule a meeting ahead of time with the Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules. That's made up of both the House and the Senate. Their main guidelines are to look at the rule and to make sure that it follows the intent of the legislature and the naval authority that the board had the authority to create the rule that it did um, to do that. They usually get a letter from the chair. I still refer it to as the Fish and Wildlife Committee. I know they've changed their name, but, and also the Senate Natural Resources Chair too, usually weighs in on every rule that's done to the rule. Those committees of jurisdiction, our rules on Fish and Wildlife, make sure that, that it's kosher to the process that's being done. So depending on what LCAR does, um, we hope for positive reaction, but from it, I think we've done a good, thorough, fair process, and this, this can work with the board. Um, then we'll move back to the board and ask them for a third vote. The whole goal is to have this become effective by January 1, 2024, um, to be the law. Um, we will be putting a placeholder in the law book on both of these activities to alert hunters and trappers to go to our website for the current regulations that they need to abide by in 2024. I can't thank you all enough. Um, thank the board for coming here and volunteering your time and, and serving on the board. I was um, pleasantly happy, thrilled to see the participation. I got to get around every group. I found everybody was respectful. I can't thank the department staff for doing due diligence of recording all the comments and, and being patient as, as people talked and made sure that they recorded in, in their verbiage of what they had to say um, to do that. I want to encourage all of you, if you have any more comments at all, please send them in with the open public comment period is to the end of this month, June 30th. Um, I can give you an email address, but I think the easiest way is just go to the department website and you'll see right on our home page, you can click on public comments for this and you can submit an email to the department. Even if you came here tonight, gave us your comments, please feel free to go back in and share any, any more comments or you want to emphasize a point, you want to add more information that would be helpful for the board um, to do this, we will collate every comment. All the questions we've received um, last night, tonight, and tomorrow night, we're gonna be doing a virtual public hearing. We will do a responsive summary for all those and provide it to the board. It will also be on our website. Um, someone asked me in one of the work groups if they can think about these questions more, will they be on the website? Yes, they will. Um, I can't know if they're on the website right now, but I'll make sure by tomorrow we get them up there with the presentation that Kim Royer did and Major Sean Fowler. Um, so you can see that again. We'll be showing that same taped presentation that you saw here tonight, tomorrow night, and then we're gonna allow people to comment again on these same questions. Um, depending on the number of people that, that connect with us tomorrow night, we'll try to figure out how, how much time to limit people um, to comment. So on 
behalf of the department um, and all the staff, um, hats off to the staff for doing a great job um, here tonight, um, and the board for being here, I can't thank you enough, and particularly the people that came here um, tonight. Whether you enjoy hunting, trapping, or just wildlife in the state of Vermont, this is important. We take every comment and your questions seriously. Um, so thank you. Um, that closes our formal part of the groups, but we are also willing to take and record any other comments that somebody wants to share with the group. Um, I'll ask you to address your statements or comments to me and to keep it within two minutes or so just to be respectful of people's time. But, um, and otherwise, if, if you want to hit the road and go home, I guess there's still a little daylight. Um, thank you for coming here tonight and safe travels. So if anybody's got a comment um, or statement that they'd like to make, uh, now's the time. And you might, I would just encourage you to maybe come down partway, halfway down the hall and project your voice so people can hear you. So I'll go, go ahead in the back. Yep. Um, I guess just a procedural question. Um, is this, do I just talk to you and not receive a response back? I, I have a question. Will, will the answer tonight by interview or give me a break? I We're not going to answer questions tonight to through the time, the process, but we want the question so we can record it and everybody here will see our response to your question. Um, not only the people that are here tonight, those who went to the public meeting last night, those who go to our website through this whole process, and those that attend virtually. So, if you have a question, please give. We've got the mic that's recording your comments now. Oh, okay. so I've got staff writing them down, too, in case you have a malfunction in your report. So, I, my question was you know, if Fish and Wildlife ever consider requiring what ACWA recommends, you use ACWA as like the gold model, right? And ACWA has the MP specific for each. They have like the Vermont or 14 different BMPs. Um, the BMPs that have been shared tonight are insufficient and they don't protect on our own species. So that was my question. If you really want to follow the ACWA's BMP process and the wildlife and wide route, then you should be requiring BMPs you know, specific for each species. And on ACWA's website, they have that listed. You know, all the different fur bear species and BMPs for each. Yes. Go ahead, thanks. Yep. Yeah, I'm feeling into that. 
Right, stand up. Can you just say where you're from? I'm from Delaware. What George said, I can foresee going forward if more than 100 people apply for the permits, uh, it should be done with a lottery system like that. Yep. Everybody, you know, it shouldn't be first come, first serve. It should be done with a lottery system. Thank you. Sorry, you should say that. Jump over this slide. Far back. Go ahead. Yep, you got it. Last. You're the one. Thank you. And I want to speak to the EMP. Also, uh, the legislative mandate in Act 159 uh, directed the department to reduce animal suffering by introducing BMPs, but yet there's no change to the use of the Conibear 220 for fisher trapping. I've provided a research paper done by researchers, Fur Institute of Canada, uh, at the BMP testing laboratory that proves, and I quote, although, although the Conibear 220 trap is often recommended as an alternative to the steel lead hole trap, it is unlikely that it has the potential to mainly kill fisher. So I want to know why it is then included in the fisher BMP still. I've asked Green Hand Fur, the project leader of the fur uh, department, I haven't gotten an answer. I've asked David Salisbury, I haven't gotten an answer. Uh, I would really like to know why a trap that does not pass BMP testing, uh, the research facility is being allowed to use. You have a copy of the scientific paper you want to provide in for evidence. Okay, we'll look for it. Can't find it, you know where to find it. Yes. Okay, thank, thank you, Rob. Okay, thanks. Anybody in this middle section want to say anything here tonight? Going over to the left, um, right to the right. Go ahead, sir. Name down in front. Jerry Kamiko from Roxbury. Yeah. I want to speak on behalf of adopting the best management practices in the Vermont traffic regulations. I'm a trapper in trapping in the 1950s. I'm a member of the Vermont Trappers Association. I was involved in the PTA as we just discussed how best to improve better practices to address legitimate concerns about safety and welfare of trapped animals. PTA spent many months discussing and developing the best management practices, also known as BMPs, which we presented to the department. Okay. Tonight you will hear, you will receive comments from the recreational lobbyists from several anti-hunting and anti-trapping groups about the cruelty of trapping and other arguments that trapping should not be allowed. But this hearing should only be about the methods, about the merits of adopting these communities. One of their arguments will be that these regulations are unenforceable. This is a specious argument at best. Since responsible people act responsibly, when these GMPs are adopted, the trap, as I know, will follow these regulations. BMP. The BTA does not condone the irresponsible trapping. Most of the anti truck anti trapping arguments will be describing one of the This one has, this incident has to go back to that incident, that dog that unfortunately was caught in a, uh, in a 220 last year. As I mentioned, BT, BTA does not condone irresponsible trapping and works with law enforcement to, to, to have these people. I've never heard any of these anti, anti groups disassociate themselves from the echo terrorists in their group. I would also like to speak in favor of the continuing the hunting of coyotes and hounds. I have not hunted coyotes and hounds, but I support the activity. In Massachusetts, where limited traffic and hunting opportunities exist, there are numerous recent accounts of coyotes and hunting people. Because the animals are not hunted, they have lost their fear. Counting reinforces that fear of man and wild And this fear will likely reduce the animal. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Let's have a little bit of
I issue is a little bit of a side issue and has to do with public safety. Setbacks are one aspect of public safety. Another aspect is signage for trapping areas. I think it's really important that everybody think about this, consider it. I think it should be a requirement. My dog, Clara, was killed in December of last year by a body ripping trap. She died in my arms a half mile from my house and I carried her back to my car and took her home. The game worker came the next morning and got the trap off of her neck. Um, if there had been signage at the front of that, uh, the top of that road, um, she would not have been killed that way. Um, I think the onus, the responsibility is on you, trappers, and the Fish and Wildlife Department to make this a requirement. I don't see any reason why it's not a requirement. Are you afraid that your traps will be sabotaged? Are you, you don't like the idea of somebody telling what you want to do on your private property? Um, is, do you feel it's a hiker's responsibility to inquire from every property owner where you happen to be hiking that day? Hey, do you have traps on your property this fall? Um, us hikers, and there are 69% of us in the state, according to your Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department Responsible Management Survey, there's 69 Vermonters who like to hike um, in the state. And we are all at risk for five months out of the year, man. That's a long time. So I would just like to you know, put it on the record that I think this is something that really needs to be considered. It does not address um, the suffering and, and distress of trapped animals, but it does help to maybe keep our pets a little bit safer and children and us as well. Thank you. Thank you.
What? Name and town of residence. So the difference said the leash law. I'm so glad I said that because it's so ironic that there's a leash law for pets, but the county there's no leash law. It's just the the, the, the irony of that is uh, the Second point I want to make is about the uh, posting land. The penalties you put in place for pounds going and posting land is completely inadequate. And I want that on record to say you should lose your posting license for life if your dog goes on the posting land. If you're in control of it, it shouldn't be a problem, right, buddy? You're in control. So why do you let that happen? That's good. Thank you. I believe you made that comment in the group, so I thought yeah, I believe we wrote it down. So thank you. Okay, great. Awesome. Anyone else that hasn't had a chance to speak tonight? I need questions. Go ahead. Yes.